is good. And his mercy endures forever. Say this, say, Jesus is Lord over the United States of America. Aren't you glad? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You know, Wednesday night we showed a movie, like John said, the holiday weekend, big holiday weekend. Actually, we had more people here Wednesday night than we have here this morning. But in case you're wondering, if you weren't here, the movie we show, showed was The Resurrection of Gavin Smith. The Resurrection of uh, Gavin Stone. Gavin Stone. I don't know why I said Smith. The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. Praise God. And you can see that on Netflix free if you have Netflix. And it's a good movie. It's a good movie. Praise God. I think you can also see it on Amazon, but it costs you $3.99. Uh, but you can see it on Netflix. Glory to God. Last Sunday, uh, I read out of this book, Healing the Mind and Emotions of the Oppressed. And uh, Rick Renner, you know, this is based on a week-long teaching he did on his TV program, and they just made a booklet to go with it. He, he talks about the difference between depression and oppression, you know, oppressed in your mind, uh, and it can be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. But I, I, I read from this book about what happened to him as a young child through teachers, through coaches, through placement tests, and on and on and on, how his mind was bombarded with thoughts about himself that he eventually believed that controlled his life that were absolutely not true whatsoever. And so I, I read that story and that resonated with a lot of people. So people asked me for this book. Well, this wasn't a book that we had, but uh, we went out and got some of them. Now, we didn't get this through a bookstore. We just, we, actually, we just got it through Amazon. So, so our price, you know, our price. I think it cost us $8 for this book. Is that right, Heather? We got several of those because people ask us about them. And uh, Rick tells about that. You know, I mean, he said the devil wants us to believe lies. Doesn't matter what the lie is. But he wants us to believe his lies because if he can deceive us into believing a lie, then that lie will become our reality. It may not be true, but it doesn't matter. It will become our reality. Oppression will leave the mental and spiritual realm and it will become a reality in your life. And so, uh, you know, he tells the story that I read last week, and that's what most people were interested in. But as you get into this book, you know, this is Rick Renner, Greek scholar, who, by the way, you know, the devil was trying to tell him he was stupid. <laughs> one of the most brilliant people that you'd ever meet. But he goes into great detail. You know him. He's going to break down all these Greek words of uh, God and honor Jesus to set the captive free and uh, all those that were oppressed of the devil. And he's going to go into anointing, power, healing, oppressed, imaginations, wrong thinking. Anyway, that book is out there and available if you want it. Praise God. And if we need more, we will get more. Uh, again, it's $8 and that's our cost. That's just so that we can put it in the people's hands that wanted it. Can you say Amen. Well, are you ready for the Word of God this morning? Amen. Amen. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1. Yay. Yay, thank God for the Word. Matthew 5, verse number 1. Glad to have you with us if you're online. Praise God. Good to see you all here this morning. Matthew, the fifth chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Matthew 5, 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, these are, he goes on to give several more, blessed are these, you know, and these are known as the Beatitudes. Beatitude means you're supremely blessed and full of great joy. So in other words, what he's saying is if you will do this, then it will cause you to be blessed, or as beatitude means, you, you'll experience it. It's really just, just un, un, great joy, bliss, happiness, joy, glory to God. And so Jesus says to his disciples, this isn't the way you get saved. He's talking to his disciples and said, listen, if you do such and such, you will be blessed. Amplify on the word blessed, that means you'll be divinely favored. You'll be fortunate. See, sometimes people use the word fortunate to mean, you know, something good happened and you had nothing to do with it. But that's not what the Bible means. That's not what I mean when I say fortunate this morning. You are fortunate. You are experiencing well-being. You are experiencing something good because you did what Jesus said to do. So, so number one, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you do these things, if you have this attitude, you'll be divinely favored. You'll be fortunate. You'll be joyous. You'll be graced and you'll be empowered to overcome and to succeed. Can you say amen? amen? 
So he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, if you read Luke's gospel, it says, blessed are the poor. But, you, you know, if you're going to properly interpret the scripture, one of the secrets to, to Bible interpretation is to let scripture interpret scripture. And so, you know, 2 Timothy 2, 15 says we are to rightly divide the Bible, rightly divide the truth. Well, if you can rightly divide it, you can wrongly divide it. <laughs> I mean, you can come to the wrong conclusion. And so he says, listen, uh, to properly and accurately and correctly understand the Bible, you're going to have to, for one thing, you're going to have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So when we compare both passages... And we see that when Luke says, simply says, blessed are the poor, when you compare that with Matthew's gospel, he means the poor in spirit. So in other words, Jesus did not say, Jesus did not say, Jesus did not say, blessed are the poor, meaning blessed are the poor financially. No, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And, and it's amazing, it's a simple thing, but it's amazing that a lot of people think Jesus said the blessed, blessed are the poor financially. He never said that. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Amen. In other words, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, that means you recognize that spiritually you're bankrupt. Spiritually you're poor and in need of God, desperately in need of God. You can't do it on your own. You can't save yourself. And even after you get saved, you can't live successfully, not really. You can't live victoriously, not really, on your own. Now, a lot of people think they are, but ultimately and finally, not really. So this person will be blessed. The person that recognizes their spiritual condition, their true spiritual condition, that is that spiritually we are bankrupt and we are poor and we need God. And poor here means to be, the word poor here means to be totally destitute. You are so needy that you have become a beggar. A beggar. In other words, to be blessed, it all starts with realizing our true spiritual condition. If you want to be favored, if you want to be fortunate, if you want to have God's hand on your life to help you, spiritually, we are desperate and destitute. We do not have the ability to improve our condition. We do not have the ability to help ourselves. We do not have the ability to make it. We desperately need great grace and we desperately need a Savior. I know some people don't, don't think that. They think, well, you know, my, my mind, my might, my power, my ability to, to work hard, you know, causes me to be blessed. You can't even take your next breath apart from Jesus. <laughs> you, 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 people don't realize you can't breathe. Your ability to, your, your physical strength to work comes from heaven. It, God, you know, that, that on the sinner and saint alike, that comes from heaven. God says it, the rain comes and the, you know, and the, and the, I wish it'd come around here a little bit more lately at my house, but the rains come and the sun shines on the just and the unjust. That all comes from God. Our ability to think and be clever, that comes from God. So really, truly, 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 apart from him, we can't do nothing. You, you can't think, you can't even take your next breath apart from God. A lot of people just don't realize it. And you see that even after we're saved, and here's the crux of my message this morning, even after we're saved, we need to depend on God's grace, his power, his might, his wisdom, his smarts, and not be self-dependent and self-reliant. So you see, those that are poor in spirit are humble. A humble man recognizes their absolute need. They rely on God. They reverence God. And they look to him for everything in every situation. Glory to God. In other words, they have the fear of the Lord. Well, what's the fear of the Lord? Well, you know, people say the, the reverential respect of God. And that's true. I like to say it this way. The fear of the Lord is deep reverence and admiration and awe and respect for Almighty God. But because you have that deep reverence for God and admiration for God, that leads you to rely on Him, to trust on Him, and to recognize that He is God and that He has all the answers. Amen. And, and you recognize, if you really have the fear of the Lord, you recognize that, that only what He says is right. Only what He says is perfect. Only what he says, nothing else is, is perfect. Nothing else is right. Nothing else is true. I reverence God. I don't care what I think about it. I don't care what you think about it. I don't care what some politician thinks about it or some famous person thinks about it. I only care what God thinks about it. His way is pure. His way is right. His way is just. And so the Bible says the beginning of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and all knowledge. That's the reason, don't let somebody that doesn't live for God, that hates God, some politician, some famous person, some Hollywood elite, some, some you know, 
newscaster. They don't live for God. They don't pretend to live for God. Don't let them tell you how to live. <laughs> I'm not interested in what the, you know, that's my political statement for today on the 4th of July. But <laughs> The opposite of being poor in spirit or humble in spirit is pride. Pride, the proud person doesn't have the fear of the Lord. They don't believe they need any help. Amen. But the poor in spirit, the humble in spirit, they recognize their true spiritual condition. They recognize that they're a sinner, that they're in need of a Savior. Glory to God. But here's where things have gotten off, even among Christians. Listen to this now. People get saved. They know they cannot save themselves. You know, they, they recognize that. They do love God. They do reverence God. But then, you know, <laughs> they get saved, but then they want to go on to, they attempt to be holy, they attempt to be consecrated, they attempt to be dedicated, they attempt to live a victorious, overcoming life, they attempt to do things for God and His kingdom, they revert right back into trying to do it in their own might, in their own strength, in their own ability, apart from grace. And it cannot be done. We are to continue to depend on God to overcome anything, to live victoriously. And, and uh, you, you know, so, so somebody gets saved and they think, well, now I've got to stay in God's good graces. I've got to earn his favor by coming to church and reading my Bible and paying the piano and because I came to church four times in a row and, and, you know, and played the piano and sang, then he's going to answer my prayer. No, 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 a thousand times no. He answers your prayer because of what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. Amen. I said, amen. And so it's not our strength and our ability and our good works or attempts to, to, to stay righteous apart from grace doesn't work, even as a Christian. So Paul said this in Galatians 5. You know, the whole book of Galatians is written because of the dual fallacy. Some people just recognize the first part that you cannot be saved by works, but you cannot go on to perfection. You cannot get answers to prayer. You cannot operate in the spirit through works. No, it's all by grace through faith. So Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, he talked about people who have fallen from grace. Now, I don't know about you, but when I grew up when I, in my church, and what I was led to believe, when, when you heard some Christian had fallen from grace, you thought about some dirty dog Christian has backslid, they've left God, they've turned their back on God, they're out living for the world now, they, they ran off from their wife and left her with the three kids, and they're doing something ugly and horrible. They've fallen from grace. Well, we don't want that to happen, but when Paul, when God, when the Bible used that expression, fallen from grace, it was identifying Christians who have turned away from grace and who are depending on their own goodness and performance and strength and abilities apart from God. That's what it means to be fallen from grace. You're trying to do it, you're, you're trying to be self, uh, uh, you know, dependent and self-reliant. That's what Paul meant. You can read it for yourself. That's what Paul meant when he said to be fallen from grace. And so when people try to be spiritual through their own good acts, that's fallen from grace. When people try to earn God's favor, they're fallen from grace. When Christians try to overcome problems and effectively carry out the work of God on the earth just because they think they can do it in their own strength, in their own might, in their own ability, that's what the Bible calls being fallen from grace. Amen? No, it's all about grace. Say it's all about grace. Glory to God. Matter of fact, that's my title, isn't it? Yeah. Say it again. It's all about grace. See, the truth is, even as Christians, we can't be holy. We can't overcome. We can't effectively do whatever it is that God has called us to do apart from the grace of God. I like a little something I read from Joyce Meyer. She says, people are extremely performance oriented. We learn from the time we are little the better we perform, the more love we receive. In our relationship with God, we, we, in our relationship with God, our thinking often continues in this pattern. We think God will love us and bless us more, the better we perform. But because we aren't able to behave right all the time, we start working and striving and trying to overcome all our weaknesses. We think God will then love us enough to do for us what we need. Our worth is not in what we do, but in what God has made us through what he has done. Our worth is not in what we do, but in what God has made us through what he has done. Every Christian knows this principle is the basis of salvation. 
We are made righteous. We are put in right standing with God through what Jesus did by dying on the cross. We cannot earn salvation by what we do. It's a free gift from God because of what Jesus did. We just need to accept it. We understand that. But even though every Christian receives salvation by believing we are made righteous with God through what he did, usually only very mature Christians continue in this truth and learn to approach all of life on the same basis. Amen. So again, we must recognize that even as Christians, that it's His ability at work in us that causes us to overcome and to be effective and fruitful. Which is, which is a, you know, grace is multifaceted. Grace has many definitions. One of the definitions of grace is His ability at work in us. His ability at work in us. See, grace is not just, listen to me, it's not just unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. That is grace, but it's not just that. Grace is everything that legally and rightfully belongs to us because Jesus died on the cross. I have a right. I have a legal right to be saved. I have a right. I have a legal right to the help of the Holy Spirit. I have a right. I have a legal right to be forgiven. All of these things. And grace is also defined as, very important, listen to me now, grace is God's ability and enabling power working in our lives. It's God's ability and enabling power working. It's His ability working in my life to help me overcome, to help me deal with things, to help me do things, to help me, uh, you know, in, in whatever He's called me to do. Glory to God, it's grace. It's all grace. So as Christians, if we try to earn God's love and help and blessings, we end up miserable. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Because as a kid going to church week after week after week, I tried for years and years and years and years to earn God's favor, to be good enough to be saved, to be good enough to be considered a Christian. And you see, as long as you do, do that, you end up miserable and you believe you are unworthy of God's blessings. You just won't let God help you because you don't think you deserve it. So Joyce Meyer goes on to say in this little book, I'm reading this little book called Help Me, I'm Insecure. Yeah, that's a good title, isn't it? <laughs> she goes on to say, it's wonderful not to start the day by waking up and hating yourself. <laughs> it's wonderful not to start the day by waking up and hating yourself for half an hour before you ever get out of bed. I wake up to hear the devil rattling in your ears a list of all the mistakes you made the day before or whenever, telling you that you're a failure and can't expect God to do anything good for you. Many people are beat down before they ever get their feet on, before they ever get their feet on the floor in the morning. The devil's plan is to deceive us into continuing to base our worth on our performance, then keep us focused on our faults and shortcomings. Satan wants us to have a low opinion of ourselves and be so insecure that we live ineffectively for God, being miserable and unreceptive to God's blessings because we don't think we deserve them. Amen. So it's all by grace. We must operate in grace, 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 and more grace. Can you say amen? Now, now I realized even yesterday I came home and told my, my family, Margaret and my brother-in-law and sister-in-law there who were very happy to have with us this morning. When I got through with this message, I realized I, I'm going to cut out about half of this to get to where I believe God wants us to go. Now, some of you are just a little too excited about that, but <laughs> nonetheless, I forgive you. So I'm going to skip this whole section because really this is all geared to just five or six minutes of ministry at the end to get people to receive God's grace. But I, I do want to quote something to you here from, uh, this is from Max Licato. He's talking about the rich young ruler. You know, the rich young ruler, because of people's prejudice against the prosperity message, missed the point. It's all about the rich young ruler was trying to get God to earn salvation and, on his own terms. Money's just the one of a thousand things that could stand in your way. And so Max Locato in his wonderful style says, he asked the teacher, what good thing must I do to, to, to get eternal life? The wording of his question betrays his misunderstanding. He thinks he can get eternal life as he gets everything else by his own strength, his own ability, his own power. What must I do? You see, it wasn't the money that hindered the rich man. It was the self-sufficiency. It wasn't the possessions. It was the pomp. It wasn't the big bucks. It was his big head. 
How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? It's not just the rich who have difficulty. So do the educated, the strong, the good looking, the popular, the righteous. So do you if you think your piety, your holiness, your morals or power qualifies you as a kingdom candidate. And you see, that's true of, of salvation. The rich young ruler needed grace just like we all need grace. But even after we're saved, don't miss the point here, even after we're saved, in order to overcome the problems of life, we need God's grace. We need God's power. We need God's help. We need God's wisdom. We need God's strength. We need God's ability to work in our lives. You know, Jesus said, apart from me, you cannot do anything. Again, whether we recognize it or not, you can't even take your next breath apart from God. Oh, see, the Lord is good to all. Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the branch. I am the vine. You're the branch. And you know, it's like, it's like a tree limb. You cut that tree limb off. And, and any time you're trying to do it on your own, you're separated from the tree. Where all the stuff comes <laughs> that the limb needs to produce whatever fruit it's trying to produce. And so apart from me, that Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now with that in mind, let's turn over to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah 4, verse number 6. Oh, we want to get this. Zechariah 4, verse number 6. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. This is God, the prophet talking to God through Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Well, that's a, you know, a well-known scripture, particularly in our circles, Pentecostal circles. You know, it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by the spirit of God that we accomplish anything. Not by my might, my power, my smarts, my wisdom, my strength, my ability, my making it work, my kicking it, you know. Some people in the natural are, are, are pretty good. They can just about kick a dead horse back to life. But ultimately and finally, it won't stand. No, in order to do something for God, it's not by human might, it's not by human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, you know that scripture, but watch the context of that scripture. Next verse, verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. In other words, this mountain is going to be removed. This mountain is going to become flat. And shall bring forth the capstone. What's he talking about? We'll see in a minute. In other words, he's going to get the job done with shouts of grace, grace, grace to it. Now, understand what he's talking about here. When he says, before you Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel is doing something for God, but he's facing opposition, tremendous opposition. That opposition is referred to as a mountain. You remember Jesus referred to mountains as problems. He said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, this problem, this, this issue, that you, whoever shall say to this mountain. And so he says this mountain refers to the problem, the obstacle they are facing. So here's the picture. The Jews have been in Babylonian captivity. You remember that. Under the Old Testament, you know, they, they just failed and failed and failed and failed and God warned them and warned them and warned them, but they failed and failed and refused to live for God. So finally the Assyrians came down, defeated them, and not just defeated them, they took them away from Israel, took them away from Jerusalem, all these miles, hundreds of miles away to Assyria. And so they're, they're in captivity and God said, you're going to remain there for 70 years. Well, at the appropriate time, you know, uh, the 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 Syrian government allowed a certain number of Jews to go back from Babylon. They were in Babylonian captivity. He allowed them to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel, the books Haggai and Zechariah are all talk about this. Haggai is a prophet. Zechariah is a prophet. You know, they're, they're ministering to the people, prophesying to the people, encouraging the people to do the work that God has called them to do. And Zerubbabel is the governor of the people. He's the leader of the people. And he's the one that is particularly called and commissioned by God to lead this first group of people back to Jerusalem where they are 
commissioned by God and commanded by God to rebuild the temple. In other words, Solomon's temple had been flattened, totally destroyed. So they had to rebuild the temple. Amen. Well, <laughs> they face incredible opposition. The locals didn't want them to rebuild the temple. You say, yeah, but the Assyrian government told them to go back and rebuild it, you know, and they have to answer to them. Well, I know, but we got states that no matter what the federal law is, no matter what the Supreme Court does, they just do whatever the heck they want to do. You understand? So they had that kind of thing going on. So when they went back to rebuild the temple, the people don't want the Jews to come back and reestablish their great empire. That's the last thing they want. And it starts with rebuilding the temple. Later, another group came back. This is what Nehemiah is all about. Nehemiah, Nehemiah came back to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. They don't want that to happen. They fight against this. They physically fight them and stand against them from doing that. You remember we're talking about, and Nehemiah is talking about people rebuilding the, the, the walls around the city of Jerusalem. It says they worked on the wall with one hand and carried a weapon in the other. And so when they were rebuilding the temple, they in essence went out on what we, would, what we would call today, they took out court orders to stop them from rebuilding the temple. God said rebuild the temple, but you got people fighting against you, you got people working against you, you got people opposing you, and, and, and you, they're, 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 they're literally fighting against you. And Lord, they took out a court. They told us we can't build a church over here in this side of town. Yeah, but God said do it. <laughs> so they're facing opposition. Amen. And plus, the people became apathetic and discouraged about the work, so they just quit working on it. I mean, you know, they're trying to, the rubble's trying to get the people to work. And you go back in Haggai, and it says, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this temple lies in ruin? In other words, they had forgot all about the work of God. They got there. They started out working enthusiastically, but they faced this opposition. They faced these problems. They're working on the temple, you know, and then they just kind of got apathetic and they got discouraged because of the problems they faced and they just quit working on it. So Haggai says, consider, consider this. And he starts telling them all the wrong things that are going on in their life because they're not doing what God has called them to do. So they faced uh, apathy. There was discouragement. They faced opposition from the locals, court orders. People literally fought against them. And they didn't have any money to build this temple. Solomon's temple was beautiful. Glory to God. I mean, Solomon had unlimited resources when he built the temple. You remember David wanted to build God a house, a permanent house. You know, not just a tent, but a beautiful temple. But, but God told David, he said, no, you're not going to do it. Your son Solomon's going to do it. So, so David, who is extremely, extremely, extremely wealthy, he's a king. He had tremendous personal wealth. And so he saved up money and took up money to build the temple for many, many years. And so Solomon came along and had unlimited resources. It's estimated the temple with all the belongings in the temple was worth in today's economy about a billion dollars. Yeah. And so, so, you know, people that have trouble with churches building a nice building, shh, we don't even compare to Solomon's temple. You've got to be kidding me. And God's the one that gave him the design for the building. I said, God's the one that gave him the design. And so, so Solomon is powerful. He's, he has wealth more than you can imagine. But these Jews, they had no power. They had no army. They had no ability. And they had no money. And they were discouraged. And they faced tremendous opposition. And they were apathetic. And they quit doing the work of the Lord. <laughs> because to them, I mean, I mean, when you really look at this, when you really, really look at this, you know, when we think of great miracles, we think of Moses at the Red Sea and the Red Sea splitting or Daniel in the lion's den. But to rebuild this temple to, to, was a tremendous, tremendous miracle. Matter of fact, at one point, you know, he was talking about their discouragement. In Ezra, you can read this in Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 through 17, when they, were, they, they got to a point that they finally at least laid the foundation of the temple. 
So they had to have it. We're going to have a big party. We're going to have a big celebration. And so they all got together and it says they were celebrating. We, we at least laid the foundation and the people began to shout and rejoice. But then it says, but the older people, see the older people there, they had lived in Jerusalem. They had seen Solomon's temple and this thing looked pathetic to them. And it says they lifted up their voice loudly and began to weep uncontrollably. Because it just seems so pathetic to them. Matter of fact, you can read that as you go on reading here. Uh, in verse number 8 it says, Moreover the word of the Lord came, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. See, right now when he's talking to them, that's all they've got is the foundation. His hand shall finish it. Why shall he finish it? Because of God's grace. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. For who has despised the day of small things? Who has despised, it may seem like a small thing, a little thing, but don't despise the day of small beginnings. It may not seem like very much that you're singing in the choir or working in that little Sunday school room, but don't despise the day of small things. You just depend on the, the, the grace of God and watch what God does. And, the, and he says, so, so he said, the, the heaven for these seven rejoiced to see it, the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel, they hadn't even built it yet. He just got the plumb line. He says, but the, the seven that rejoice in heaven is, that, that's people in heaven, beings in heaven. And he says, they, they rejoice to see that it was being done. Glory to God. Amen. So I was talking to Margaret this morning. She says, you know, I never would know what you're going to preach on. So I gave her a little preview. And she said, you know, some things are not an instant miracle. Sometimes you don't need an instant miracle like Daniel in the lion's den. Some things are just day by day by day doing what God called you to do and having the grace to do it, the ability to do it, the strength to do it, the money to do it, and just watching God take you, just, just watching God destroy that giant mountain and making it a molehill before your eyes. Because you day by day by day depend on his grace instead of your ability. Can you say amen? amen. So, so this will make more sense to you now. Back up and read it again. Chapter six, chapter four, verse six. This is the word of the Lord. It's not by might. It's not by power. Yeah, you can't overcome all these obstacles. You can't overcome all these challenges. You don't have the money to do this. You don't have the might to do this. You don't have the army to do this. You don't have the smarts to do it. But it's not going to be overcome. It's not going to be done by those things. It's going to be done by my spirit, says the Lord of, Lord, Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Whatever mountain that it is. This was their particular mountain. Whatever mountain it is in your life. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And, when you, and you shall bring forth the capstone. The capstone is the final piece to the building they were working on. When you bring forth the capstone, in other words, it is going to get built and you're going to shout grace, grace, grace. It was all done by the grace of God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Amen. I like, I like what Warren Wiersbe says. He, he's talking about this scripture. He said there are three ways we can attempt to do the work of God. We can trust our strength and wisdom. We can borrow from the resources of the world or we can depend on the power of God. The first two approaches may appear to succeed, but they fail in the end. Only work done through the power of the Spirit will glorify God and endure the fires of judgment. But it's not just doing the work of God. You could say this, there are only three ways you can overcome some problem in your life. You can do it in your own ability and might and strength. Try to. You can depend on the world to help you, or you can depend on the power of God. When I first, first, first was a pastor in Tifton, Georgia, and I went, Tifton, Georgia, I went to this little minister's retreat. There's just like 23 of us there, just independent ministries, you know, with our different churches. And there was a guy there that everybody looked to because, man, this guy had been famous. He had been the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Brunswick of, you know, several thousand people. And he had been over a Bible college over in Europe. And I I'll never forget his testimony. He said, he said, the Lord showed me because, you see, he, 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 he accomplished great things for God. But he said, I mostly did it just in my own natural ability and wisdom. He said, I knew how to build a church. I knew how to do things for God. But he said, God showed me it was all wood, hay, and stubble and wouldn't, wouldn't withstand in heaven. Because I, I did it. 
Now, most of us don't have the abilities that this man had, but he, he said, I could do it. So he, he, he man, he, he was a leader, but he led from the back. And you couldn't get this man to do anything unless he knew God was in it and God was going to enable him to do it because we need to do things that last. But it's not just doing things that last. Like I said, we can't overcome, not really, apart from his help. Glory to God. In other words, when they, when they finished, the people shouted for joy and they glorified God and they knew it was the grace of God that did it. Now, listen to Zechariah 4, 7 from the Amplified Bible. What are you, O great mountain of obstacles, before Zerubbabel, who will rebuild the temple? You will become a plain. You will become insignificant. And he will bring out the capstone of the new temple with loud shouts of grace, grace to it. That scripture mean more to you now? The Living Bible. Therefore, no mountain, however high, can stand before Zerubbabel, for it will flatten out before him. Zerubbabel will finish building this temple with mighty shouts of thanksgiving for God's mercy, declaring this was all done by grace alone. It's all by grace and grace alone. Can you say amen? So even though they faced all these different problems, they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't do it. They had no ability to do it. They had no might to do it. They had no money to do it. They had no power to do it. Plus, people are trying to stop them every way you can try to stop them. But when they simply stepped out in faith and received God's health, when they stepped out in faith and obedience, the grace came. It doesn't just automatically come. When they stepped out in faith and obedience, the grace came. The power came. The might came. The wisdom came. The strength came. The money came. Everything they needed came to move this particular mountain. The help that they needed came to move this particular mountain. Got any mountains in your life this morning? Got any mountain in your life this morning? Are you at your wits end about some family problem? Some financial problem? Some problem with your health? Are you struggling to overcome some, some sinful habit? Are you struggling financially, struggling mentally, struggling to... In your, in your marriage? Have you done all you need to know? Done to, have you done all you know how to do and it's not working? Do you have a situation in your life where you say, I, I, can't, I can't deal with this anymore? It could be anger. It could be depression. It could be oppression. It doesn't matter what it is. It's time to recognize and admit that you can't fix this on your own. None of us can really really, really ever fix anything on her. We may think we can, but not really. We need God's grace. It's time to look to God and rely on God. Now watch this. And the way to move your mountain is, is I summed up for you in one sentence. The way to move your mountain is to cry out to God in faith. Everybody say in faith. A lot of people cry out to God and they get no help whatsoever. They cry out to God in desperation and they get no help. They're sincere. They mean it with all their heart. But that will not help you. It will not cause the grace of God, the favor of God, the ability of God, the might of God, the wisdom that you need, the strength that you need, the whatever. It will not cause that. Just crying out won't help you. It will not help you. The cry of desperation because, you know, in trying to convince God of how bad your situation is will not help you. God already knows how bad your situation is. Whether we believe it or not, God wants to help us more than we want to be helped. God wants you healed in your body more than you want to be healed. So I can't imagine that, but it's true. God wants to fix your family problem more than you want it to be fixed. God wants to, to, to help you in your finances more than you want the money. He really does. Listen, why does, why, does, why, why does it work just to cry out in desperation? Because 
Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. He looked down and he saw my condition and he saw your condition and he saw your present day right now today problem and he saw my present day right now problem and he said and he was moved with compassion and he says I'm going to do something about it and he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that we would not have to be oppressed in any area or in any way. He already did some. There's nothing more that he can do. He already did it. It's a matter of us receiving by faith what he did. See, faith is our spiritual hand whereby we reach up and take what God has done. If we don't take it, it never becomes ours. And God's, I mean, he's, he won't make you do anything, but he's offering it to you and he's trying to say, please, 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 I see your need. I know you're hurting I will help you. I will grace you. But you've got to receive it. When you receive it, then it'll come. Amen. So God already loves you. He already sees your problem. He already cares. He already did something about your situation. He sent Jesus to die on the cross to meet every need. He needs you to cry out in faith and receive his help. Faith received. Faith takes. That's why the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. Faith takes what grace offers. And if you don't take it, it never becomes yours. If you don't take it, it never becomes yours. So just that's why just crying out in desperation and crying out in fear doesn't work because it doesn't take anything. It just says my problem is overwhelming. So cry out in faith and take God's help. Take grace. Believe that God hears your prayer and he helps you and he empowers you, and he's giving you what you need, and expect God to move in your life. And so many times by expecting him to move in your life, and, you know, when we started a church, we started, you know, we was involved in several pioneer projects. When we started a church, it wasn't just <laughs> Red Sea, all of a sudden there's a brand new building, whole people, group of people. No, 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 no. It was day by day by day by day by day by day, and experiencing grace over and over and over again. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stand up. Stand up on your feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Stand up. Do do you get this? Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can trust your own strength, the Warren Worsby says. You can can look to the world or you can depend on the power of God. How do you get this power of God? I mean, everybody knows the power of God will fix anything, right? Everybody knows the grace of God will fix it. How do you get it to work in your life? You simply ask God for it and you believe he gives it to you. That's how you get saved. Amen. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Bow your heads. We do that to reverence God and to just shut out everything around you. It's like you're the only person in the building. Amen. Pray this in your own way. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. Just pray this with me. Say, Lord God, I recognize my need. I recognize my need for your help. That's true in every area of life. We all desperately need God every day of our lives, like I said, whether we realize or not. (laughs) Yeah, but I went out and I did that. You couldn't even get out of bed without God's help. You just don't know it. People don't. Say it to yourself. Say it. I recognize my need for your help. Say, I can't do this on my own. So I'm looking to you. I know that your grace is available to me. Grace to deliver. Grace to give me the breakthrough that I need. And see, when God graces you, you know, say, you receive his grace. Receive. Say, I receive your grace, your power, your enabling ability, your might, your wisdom, Your direction, your strength, your help. I receive it right now. And I thank you for it. Glory to God. Amen. 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 And so you see people that have been struggling with some. I know I see people that have been struggling with some sin for 20 years. All of a sudden they just just accept by faith that Jesus set them free. Glory to God. And they ignore their feelings. They just say, I believe that, that power, that enabling power is working through me, operating through them. And then all of a sudden, the, 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 that sin's power is broken over their life. Do you believe that you're graced by God? 
I said, do you believe your grace by God? Do you believe His grace will help you overcome? Well, if you believe that, then as an act of faith, faith just, just lift your voice and thank God for helping you. Thank God. See, that's one of, the, one of the greatest expressions of faith there is, is you thank God in advance, even though you don't feel like it, even though you don't see anything different right yet. Say, oh, Father, I just thank you that you're helping me. I just thank you that you're helping me. I just thank you that you're empowering me. I just thank you that, you, that you're doing for me what I can't do for myself. I just thank you that it's so. See, see, faith is an act. Faith is an act. If you don't faith, faith without works, faith without actions, in other words, faith without corresponding actions is dead. It's not real. So you act like it's so. Say, well, I don't feel like it's so. We didn't say, we're not talking about feelings. We're talking about faith. Faith is an act on God's word. You choose to believe God apart from your feelings and you act like it's so. So again, lift your voice, lift your hands and thank God that his power is working in your life. His help is working in your life. That's what faith would do. I'll tell you something else faith would do. If faith would get happy about it. So get a little happy about it. Amen. Glory to God. And so Zerubbabel standing there at the time that God tells him this, they've just, they just barely got the work done. The people aren't cooperating. The people are apathetic. The people are discouraged. The people are down. They're being challenged. They're being fought against. Court orders are being taken out against them, telling them that they can't do this. They don't have the, the money to do this. And God said, it's not by your might. It's not by your spirit. But it's by my spirit. And you will get this done. And the, the temple will be rebuilt. And your mountainous problem will become flat. Glory to God. And you'll shout and be glad because God did it. You didn't do it. God did it through you. But for God to operate through you, you have to receive his help by faith in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Man, there's been so many times, especially in the ministry, because you know, I mean, my life is, my relationship with God is not being the pastor of a church, but you know, you care about the church. This is your this is your life's work, and and boy, there were some there were some when we were we were supposed to move into this building. All of a sudden, the bank called us and told us you can't have that, or we're not going to give you the money to get in that building. And the building we were in, we had left, and other people were moving in. That's when I was very aware that I didn't have the ability to do anything. <laughs> but when I called out to God, He told me exactly what to do. And it all worked to perfection. Glory to God. Amen. And it works in all areas. You got, you got just a second this early. Brother Hagin one time was, you know, Brother Hagin was noted for his healing ministry. So when he announced, you know, when there was a healing revival going on in this country in 1947 all the way into the 50s, you know. And so, you know, because people saw miracles, they'd bring people on on stretchers. They'd bring people from ambulances up to the church. And so Brother Hagin was noted for his healing ministry. And so he had announced in advance that he was at a church, you know, and they were going to have a healing meeting on that Friday night. And he said uh, he and the other pastor had gone to a minister's conference that they needed to go to. You know, that's part of the, you know, they needed to be there. But this happened and that happened. And all of a sudden, it was like you had to be in Atlanta an hour and a half. And everybody knows it takes two and a half hours to get there. And so, you know, he said, I got in the car with that pastor and he said, he said, uh, I got in the back seat to try to pray because, you know, they're just barely going to, the meeting's already going to be started. He's already called ahead and say, just, just start singing. And when we get there, we get there. And Brother Hagin wants to get in the back seat and he's used to praying and fasting and wants to, you know, do all this stuff. And, and he, he said, but, but he said, my God, I couldn't pray and fast. He said, I got in the back seat. There's no super highways in these days. This is the 40s, you know. And he said, this two-lane highway. And he said, he's driving like a total madman and maniac. He said, he's passing people on the right. And he said, I'm slamming all around. He said, I couldn't pray for the meeting. I had to pray for our safety. He said, I, and I mean, we got to the meeting. He said, he jumped out of the car, went running into the church. I said, I'm going to run over here to the parsonage and change my shirt, you know, real quick. And, and he said, you just keep the people going till I get in there. And he said, as I did that out of the corner of my eye, I could see that I don't remember exactly, but he said there were like four ambulances there where people have hired ambulances to bring their loved one who is so sick out of a hospital bed or a hospice room to bring them to the meeting. He said, when I get in there, there's people in wheelchairs. There's blind people there. 
and he's in there shaving and trying to get, you know, do a quick shave and put on a shirt. And, he, and he's thinking, my God, my God, my God, uh, these people are, they want to see something like they, they, they need to be healed. They need something. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And the Lord spoke to him and said, were you planning on healing them? Do you have the power? He said, no, Lord, I, I wasn't planning on healing them. I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't heal a gnat's wing. He said, and the Lord said to him, he said, don't you think that I, that I knew that you needed to be at that meeting? And I saw that things happened that were beyond your control. He said, you need to not depend on self and think that you're the one that's going to get the job done, but you need to fall back and rest in my grace. And if I had time, I'd go into details, but he went out there and they had a fantastic healing meter and people were raised off those stretchers. But it was God that did it, not him. God does it. God does it. Can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I know this crowd, so I'm not going to give an altar call this morning. But let's be doers of the word we hear. Can you say amen? amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If I was you, I'd just get by myself somewhere and I'd, I'd envision that mountain and I'd just shout grace to it. Grace! Grace! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You, you got something? Amen. Sense something here. The prophet over there, you got something? Amen. Thank you, Lord. How about you, Wyatt? You got something? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, say the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. I'm a hearer and a doer of the word I hear in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you so much. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful holiday weekend. Thank you, Jesus.